Good afternoon and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You. Um, we are delighted to, to, that you're all able to join us this evening. As usual, the reminder that instead of a, a, a fee for um, registration, please consider a charity donation to either one of our three uh, preferred charities, um, Shelter, Brian May, Save Me Trust, or the Ukraine uh, GoFundMe page, or a local charity of, of your choice, as you please. And we're thrilled to have on the show this evening, James Stevens uh, of the Home Buildings F Federation, talk about all things with Mary, all, all things house building, and in particular nutrient related. Uh, the HBF having been uh, particularly um, proactive in relation to the uh, nutrient neutrality um, issue, which has held up estimated 100,000 homes uh, at the moment. Um, so we're really looking forward, uh, James, to Mary's discussion uh, with you later on. Um, in the meantime, can you tell us where you're calling us from and um, what theme you've chosen for us and, and what, if anything, uh, you're drinking? I have to say, if anything, just in case. <laughs> I don't want to be encouraging. To take. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Charlie. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm calling from the HBF offices, uh, um, just opposite the Coin Street, the legendary Coin Street development, mm. which we're based on on South Bank. So the planners amongst the audience, which I assume is everybody, will know what I mean when I'm referring to that. Uh, and uh, I'm not drinking anything apart from water, I'm afraid, uh, uh, Charlie. But I probably will have a whiskey and ginger ale wow. when I get back home uh, late tonight. And my theme, I'm sorry, I really struggled with a the theme. I kind <laughs> of was thinking about it all last night. And I was thinking about something about literature and planning. And unfortunately, most of my favorite writers uh, tend to have quite a reactionary view when it comes to <laughs> new house building, apart from Ian Forster, you know, who's really good at it. Uh, so instead, I just, I just plump I, I just plump for some music, a uh, particular track that I like, uh, Horace Silver Quintet. Uh, Tokyo Blues. I think since the lockdown, I've just been getting into listening to uh, music a lot more and I've dusted off my hard bop uh, jazz collection. So there you go. Fantastic. Well, I, I won't say anything about my music taste. I think that's less, less is more in that respect. <laughs> now, normally at this juncture, I'd turn to Mary, but I, I can't resist going to Paul. You're not in another Audi rate roadside hotel, are you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> He can't even hear us. Well, 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 assume that's a yes, I think. Um, in the meantime, while Paul's struggling to, 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 to issue his denial um, in whatever latest roadside facility he's in, uh, Mary, um, where are you this evening? And, uh... I'm, I'm in the attic in lovely Wandsworth. Good evening, uh, everyone. And good evening, James. And um, can I say immediately, thank you very much for <laughs> introducing me to the joys of Too Much Sake by uh, the Horace Silver Quintet. And audience, Google it now uh, because you can listen uh, to this wonderful jazz. Uh, there's a great little video online. Um, and yeah, it's been a delight. And I look forward to the interview. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, and uh, Chris, how are you doing? I'm very well, Charlie. Nice to see you. And uh, hello, James. Welcome to the show. So um, you said uh, this song is too much sake. I'm not sure you can have too much sake. Look at that. In uh, in Cheltenham, we are very Japanese. It's the home of Super Dry. Did you know that, Julian Dunkerton? So uh, everything Japanese. We have two excellent top-end Japanese restaurants, Julian Dunkerton's one at 131, and Kibu, which is where I was able to just go in and buy this. I'm going to see if Paul got something from Waitrose equivalent. So I'm going to enjoy that. Presumption's got in the mood. He's got all the Japanese paraphernalia. There's the famous uh, paintings. Um, and uh, he's reading this book. Um, I've been to Japan. I think it's the most extraordinary place in the world. And do you know what that is, James? Do you know what that is? I've been there. That is a minka. That is a traditional Japanese house, and um, they are truly extraordinary as a piece of tranquility, and that's why Presumption loves it. Thanks, Chris. Earth to Tucker, do you read us? Can you hear me, Charlie? Yes, we can. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I've been defeated by the M60 this time, so I've had to pull off uh, and stay in uh, some sort of verge in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'm currently on an internet connection using my mobile phone, so I fully expect everything to collapse and go horribly wrong. So for the moment, I have nothing oh, Japanese because I was heading for the Trapper Centre to try and get something Japanese. So uh, but hello. Nice to see you, James. 
Thanks, Paul. Great to see you there. Sasha's uh, in court, uh, but he's going to join us shortly. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll introduce him when he arrives. Uh, Charlie Banner here for Keating Chambers. I'm in Scotland. Um, not somewhere that um, Paris and England are allowed to go professionally, um, uh, but I'm here in, a, in my capacity as a board member of a UK-wide body, and we've been meeting in the Holiday Inn. Funny how you never end up going on holiday in the Holiday Inn. We always end up working there, but Holiday Inn right next to Edinburgh Zoo, which is right behind me, um, which did lead to a rather surreal moment earlier, earlier today when one of my colleagues pointed in this direction of the room and said, I think there's a primate over there, and I wasn't quite sure if she was talking about me or <laughs> or the, uh, the animals behind. Um, and I'm drinking... Um, Whiskey. I actually, in, in lieu of your um, Japanese latest theme, James, I went downstairs to the bar and asked for Japanese whiskey. Not something I'd recommend doing in an English voice in Scotland. Don't think it went down very well. But um, anyway, I managed to get some. So um, without further ado, um, we're going to um, do our case reports. And actually, slightly unusually this, this week, we managed to find two decisions, um, quite topical, important decisions, from parts of um, of the UK other than England and Wales. I think Chris has covered a Scottish case um, um, in, in the past, but we've got, we're starting with a case from Northern Ireland, Paul, you're going to cover, and then I'm going to cover one from Jersey. So, Paul, over to you and tell us about um, Casement Park Gaelic Athletic Association Judicial Review. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Well, if my internet collapses, then you can take it over anyway, because you were in it, as you will recall, acting for the department as second interested party. So um, this is a judicial review uh, involving uh, a challenge to the grant of permission for the redevelopment of Casement Park in Belfast, uh, which is the home of Ulster Gaelic Athletic Association to construct a new 35,000 seater stadium. I should say courtesy of my wife, uh, she's not an Ulster GAA fan. She's a Dublin GAA fan. This is her, her shirt that she told me I've got to wave at everybody to let you know that when they build it, uh, Ul uh, Dublin will win. Up the dubs. <laughs> but, but <on> Ursula. <laughs> Thank you. Tra tragically, K Casement Park's been uh, disused for a number of years. Uh, it got a permission in the mid-20-teens, uh, which was then quashed uh, as a result of an application by the Owen Vara Residents Association. Um, th this is a further consent that was granted after that quashing and a further challenge involving the same residents association. Um, it was a decision by the Minister of Infrastructure and there are essentially two big areas of attack, one of which is a constitutional attack in relation to whether the Minister had the right uh, to make a determination without referring it back to the Executive Committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, and fascinating though that issue is, and Charlie, thank you that uh, I've spent some time reading that and learning about constitutional issues in Northern Ireland uh, and the uh, the excision of planning from the overall uh, cross-cutting cross uh, responsibility of the minister. Uh, it probably only has a fairly niche audience uh, uh, interest. So our focus on the planning challenge, which is the second ground of challenge, uh, um, uh, uh, resulting, resulting from the judgment. There were a whole series of challenges. Uh, I've scribbled down 11 uh, and a postscript, um, but they, the, the primary ones revolve around the Section 76 agreement. That's under the 2011 Northern Irish Act. There are dissimilarities from the planning system over here, but there is broad similarity. And the case law has persuasive weight over in Northern Ireland, albeit it's a different jurisdiction. Uh, the first ground uh, was a cracking ground because it was saying... Uh, we didn't get a copy of the Section 76 agreement, but by the time of the hearing, they had a copy of the Section 76 agreement and still continue to run the ground. Bingo. Uh, that failed. Uh, the second was an argument about a failure to consult on the Section 76 agreement in draft, reliant upon a case in Litchfield uh, where there had been an issue involving a landowner and a financial consequence to the landowner. And the court uh, in the Litchfield case had said there are only very particular circumstances which a common law duty to consult arose. Uh, because there is no statutory duty to consult on draft 106 obligations. Uh, and uh, the, the court in this case said uh, there was no financial interest, there was no particular exceptional justification to justify uh, consultation on the, uh, the draft section 76 agreement. Um, that's quite important in terms of any claims about consultation on a 106 uh, in England or a section 75 in Scotland. So that's, that's a point to, to take off from this. Um, there was also ground three, which is claiming that there was a legal test of necessity, which Mary and I uh, argued against each other um, back when we were baby barristers in the Plimco case. Now, I think it's second mention during the course of this case. And once again, the courts have disregarded an argument that Andrew Gilbart failed to make whilst leading me against Mary. And Mary won that argument uh, umpteen <coughs> years ago. Um, 
There was arguments about whether uh, there was a need for uh, an EIA of the Section 76 agreement, and the court said, don't be daft, there isn't. That's a procedural issue, not a substantive issue that requires EIA in its own right. Uh, there was an argument about void for voidness for uncertainty, and then there was the cracking argument, the sixth ground on the planning issue, about whether or not the, the agreement circumvented third-party rights of appeal. Uh, the court, however, pointed out that whilst there are third-party rights of appeal in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, there are no third-party rights of appeal in Northern Ireland, so that one fell flat on its face as well. Um, there were also arguments about the adequacy of the EIA, um, which is a Blewett case, uh, and the courts in, uh, endorsed that, and also a Habitat for <coughs> Eggs point. And that's another point to take away from this, which is you can't just say you haven't done a screening opinion for habitats. You need to have some basis for that. It's not just a theoretical argument. And then the final takeaway is, is under the, the title postscript in this case, where the court gave um, a, what could be described as a polite judicial dressing down to uh, the applicants in this case, so they'd be claimants in, over here, by saying, do not put prejudicial evidence in front of the court. Um, it's your responsibility as advocates to, do, to ensure that, that that's not done, uh, which is a, definitely a message for all of us. So the, the witness statement, which starts to have a go for other reasons, you're not allowed to put that in over Northern Ireland. Same rules would apply over here. Fascinating case. As I say, the constitutional stuff. Uh, Charlie will be doing a podcast for 17 hours about that later on this evening if anybody wants to watch. Thank you. You, you wish it'd be at least 18. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> uh, well, um, let's go to another part of, uh, of the uh, United Kingdom, uh, Jersey. Uh, now, Jersey is, in fact, one of my favourite places in the whole um, world. And, and the reason for that is I used to go there on holiday uh, in the summer with my my parents because my dad was, was too old to travel much further. And in fact, I think Rob has got a picture of, of the what I think is the best beach, actually, in, in the UK. So Bellards Bay Beach. There it is in all its glory. One of my favourite places in the whole, whole wide world. Really wonderful place. Recommend it. And um, this was a case about a new hospital in, in Jersey. Um, and uh, a rather remarkable thing was this was described in the inspector's report. It was an inspector who reported to the um, Jersey government who, who granted permission, described as the biggest ever infrastructure project embarked upon by the states of, of Jersey. Uh, and he conducted a public inquiry in April 2022. He reported on the 16th of May 2022. And uh, the, um, the government issued their decision the next day on the 17th of May 2022. How about that for fast track infrastructure development? I wonder if we could learn a, a thing or two from the, the good people of, of Jersey. Anyway, what was the, the main issue about the context um, for this was um, quite uh, quite convoluted, actually. So um, the, there was a need for a improved hospital in, in Jersey, not least because obviously absent adequate hospital facilities, it would be quite difficult to um, go somewhere else, um, given the uh, fact it's an island. Um, it was described by the inspector as a project that had been dogged with difficulties, uh, contention and, and delays. There had been two public inquiries into previous um, schemes in 2017 and 2018. Those concerned outline applications uh, concerning larger hospitals and on an existing hospital site in St. Helier, which is the capital of Jersey. Um, and there were not objectors to those. They'd been refused permission uh, for a number of reasons, including uh, design townscape impacts and setting on, on the grade one listed hospital on site. So this new application came along and it was different, um, both in terms of the site, which was somewhere else, a place called Overdale on the outskirts of St. Helier. And um, that itself uh, raised what the inspector described as an entirely new set of locational environmental factors. But also um, uh, it was a full application uh, considered by the inspector to provide greater certainty of uh, the design um, uh, impact of design quality and townscape impacts. And also by the time that the new application came to be considered by the inspector, it was essentially allocated by the island plan. Uh, broadly speaking, Jersey has the same statutory regime for planning as uh, we're familiar with in England, Wales, and indeed Scotland and Northern Ireland. And, and there was one development plan, in fact, the Bridging Island Plan that had been adopted in March this year, and that uh, endorsed the principle of a new hospital and the over Overdale site. Um, so the inspector then looked at the application proposal. It was a very large proposal because the, the need was, was for considerably enhanced hospital facilities, including a tall building um, and uh, various other additional large buildings. 
Um, to expect to drive the tall build, the, the main hospital is extremely large and tall building, and had to be the largest building on the island of Jersey. Um, there was a five day inquiry, um, a number of Britain reps, um, hundreds of objectors. Um, and uh, the inspector then went on to consider um, the question of accordance with the plan. And it's another illustration. We've had a few on, on this show with the Corbett and Cornwall case, um, then the, the Persimmon case in Soham, uh, and more recently, uh, one of the Yatton cases that Chris covered, another Persimmon case, where despite individual conflicts with development plan, there was accordance with the plan of, as a whole. That also there was the Dandara Hawkehurst case. So overall, accordance with the plan as a whole. And the inspector took the same, same approach here. So he... He went through a range of different aspects of the BIP, the, the island plan, which is a development plan. He found a number of conflicts because of the size of the building, the townscape, uh, design impacts, uh, etc., uh, and indeed um, some heritage impacts. Um, however, overall, because of the, um, the need for the hospital that had been enshrined in the plan and the selection of the site, and the fact that essentially, in his judgment, the, uh, the development caused the minimum amount, amount of impact that a hospital on the designated site would uh, would be able to cause uh, whilst delivering on the extent of the need, um, essentially because of those reasons, set out more fully in a 161-page report, um, the inspector considered there was accordance with the plan as a whole, despite a, a very large number of policy tensions. Uh, in relation to the World Heritage Site, um, there was in an iconic heritage of Jersey, as he called it, um, there would be uh, impacts on heritage, but uh, they wouldn't be catastrophic, as, as he described it, because the uh, building, whilst it would be seen in the same views as views of Jersey's heritage, it would be seen at some distance. Uh, and therefore, overall, he felt that according to the plan as a whole. So uh, another illustration of that very important principle, according to the plan as a whole, and an illustration that, you know, planning is not that different in, in different parts of the UK and other common law countries. And well, sometimes we can learn a thing or two about how other people do it. I'm a big, big believer in that. Um, now, uh, with that, we're going to go, um, it sounds a bit mundane, we're going to go to Chichester. Actually, we were going to go to Chichester, but we're not because Sasha isn't here. So instead, we're going to go to the equally mundane sounding destination of Rickmansworth. And Chris is going to tell us about a, a decision uh, there. Um, so over to you, Chris. You've got the short straw this week. <laughs> I can't believe you think Rickmansworth is dull. I think that's just outrageous. Uh, <laughs> I get James has got that. something to say about that. I also can't believe that you talked about Jersey for seven minutes without mentioning Bergerac. But, you know, oh, that, was, <laughs> yeah, that, that was a great series, wasn't it? it was. Okay, it so was. my my case, uh, we're going to bring it up on the screen, is from Maple Cross in Rickmansworth, and Three Rivers is the local authority, and it's a development for uh, warehouses, Class E, like everything else, uh, and 16,000 square feet of them, and then... Uh, 1,800 square feet of ancillary office space. So you know what we're looking at. Generally, it's a shed with a car park. And the decision was allowed by the inspector, Darren Hendley. Now, we've got some images, and the images are quite important. First of all, there's uh, an aerial photograph that shows us where the site is. The motorway is just a little to the north of that. Um, and uh, the large buildings to the west are part of another area of industrial buildings so it's a, a mix of uses but there's industrial next door look it's a, a largely greenfield site uh, if we go to the next image this shows us the layout now this is a case about biodiversity net gain so imagine the difficulties of trying to achieve that on a site like this where you're largely covering the site in development both in terms of the sheds but also in terms of the uh, car parking and the vehicle space for the lorries. And then finally, we've got an image that sort of demonstrates that of how urban and developed it is. Look at that. There's not much greenery in that image. And this presented a particular problem. So if we turn to um, the paragraphs relating to the appeal, um, there's some other issues, but I want to focus on biodiversity net gain. Development plan is always the starting point, and there was a development management policies local plan document adopted in 2013. So generally before all this biodiversity net gain issue took flight and uh, sets out the development should result in no net loss of biodiversity as a whole. So it's in there, but no net loss, not an actual gain. And under part A, 
states that where development would affect a species in need of conservation by the UK Biodiversity Action Plan, amongst other protections, that will not be permitted where there's an adverse impact on ecological, geological and biodiversity interests of the site, unless it could be demonstrated the need for the development would outweigh it. So a bit like the heritage test, do the benefits of the scheme outweigh the harm that would be caused in terms of the, the loss of biodiversity and through mitigation and, if necessary, compensation? And there was a species here, the forest of moth, that needed special conservation under the BAP series. It had been considered extinct in Hertfordshire for the enthusiast, uh, and therefore um, that was a relevant species. So we go forward to the next paragraph. Um, we can see that part D of that policy required that development must conserve, enhance, and where appropriate, restore biodiversity. It refers to measures to protect and compensate. We see a lot of that. I've had a conference about that in my hometown here of Cheltenham today about what actually does the policy require. It really is a, a, a good question for a lawyer as to what is actually required there. Those are very vague, open requirements. Um, and then there was SA2, and it concerned biodiversity as regard the allocation. It states measures to avoid adverse impacts and to enhance diversity will need to be provided. It takes, as the inspector says, a more permissive approach to development than the stringent part of policy DM6. So here we've got quite a mixed bag of policies, some of them quite stringent, uh, some of them in terms of the allocation, which might be considered the dominant policy, according to Duncan Oosley's approach, um, you, you, you're looking at a policy that actually is specific to the site because it's an allocation. And then, of course, the inspector refers to the MPPF paragraph 174, which we all know about, which does talk about providing net gains for biodiversity. So that's the that's the position in terms of the policies. So the inspector turned to uh, I think that's all the paragraphs we've got covered. Um, the inspector then turned to um, consider the merits of this issue. And um, through various statements of common ground, the council adopted the same position as the appellant. They'd refused it on this issue of, uh, about the forest and moth and biodiversity net gain and water uh, quality as well. But through the statements of common ground, they um, they withdrew effectively. They triggered the appeal and walked away. Now, we've seen that lots of times before, haven't we? That happened to me in Ledbury. It happens quite a bit. But that allowed the local action group to fight on their case. That was the Maple Cross Residence Environment Group. Now, the inspector observed the Environment Act 2021 provided for provides for 10% biodiversity net gain, but the statutory requirement hasn't yet been enacted. We know that. Uh, we've seen that in other cases like my Malmesbury case uh, and others that people have done. Um, and he noted there'd be further consultation required and then further legislation before it came into force, as well as guidance and publication of the biodiversity metric by the Secretary of State. Now, there's one by DEFRA. We've seen various versions of that, but it's not yet endorsed by the Secretary of State. So it is just a persuasive metric. I think people sometimes forget that. And as the inspector observed, neither policy DM6 nor SA2 make reference to biodiversity net gain, just biodiversity protection. So the inspector took the view it wasn't a matter for the development plan in terms of biodiversity net gain, but he did think it was relevant in terms of the MPPF and the PPG. And he was referred to various versions of the metric. But the key dispute in this case was about the existing classification of the site. So the baseline that you look at, which is requiring this biodiversity net gain, which you can achieve at 1% through the requirements of um, what is set out in the MPPF, which doesn't obviously set the 10% yet. And what happened was the local action group said it was classified as a lowland meadow, whereas the appellant and the council's consultant said it was grassland, which contained some lowland meadow species, but that didn't make the whole site lowland meadow. So there's a dispute there, which the inspector observed was unsatisfactory, and he had to reach a view about that. And he took the view that the council and the appellant had the more persuasive evidence because they would built up a lot more survey work over the period of time. Why was that significant? Because if the appellants were right, they had to pay a sum of 143000 If the residents group were right, it was closer to half a million, 425000 So the inspector took the view that um, the appellant was right. He judged that the council and the appellant's figure was more proportionate, looking at whether it was fairly and reasonably related 
in scale and kind to the development. And uh, as far as the debate about the Forest of Moth is concerned, the residents said the grassland should be translocated as there's a possibility the larvae, larvae from, the, um, from the moth could be on the grass. There'd been one sighting in 2021, but the inspector judged that completely, well, just unreasonable to have to translocate all the grassland. So a very practical decision from the inspector based on who had the better evidence and a reasonable approach to dealing with the moth. He applied the benefits of the proposal as per policy DM6, uh, and, um, and that was an unmet need for 40,000 square metres of such warehouse space, and he granted planning permission. I think we've got the appearance pages as well. Well done to uh, Giles Cannock uh, with his success there. Uh, it was Tim Sturgis's case from Avison Young, and uh, obviously you can see quite a bit of uh, ecological evidence given. The lesson out of all this is that we're still only needing to require biodiversity net gain of potentially 1% as opposed to 10% until the legislation changes. Well done, Giles. Thanks, Chris, for that ecological tour de force. If David Bellamy was still alive, he'd be worried about his job. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pass over to Mary to introduce James and kick off our discussion. Can I just say, I'm going to be asking all the audience questions, so please do. I'm sure lots of you got got all sorts of questions, either nutrient-related or indeed related to anything else that HBF has been doing. So please do add some uh, questions to the comments box. Over to you, Mary. Thank you very much. James, let me just first introduce you. You're a char chartered town planner. Uh, you studied medieval history uh, at Liverpool, following which uh, you got an MA in town planning at Southbank. And of particular note, you were the RTPI student of the year and you won the prize for your th thesis on the deployment of conservation areas as devices to insulate against regeneration. Um, a topic which sounds very, very interesting in the context of estate regeneration now. You've been with the HPF for some time and you started as the strategic uh, planner with responsibility for London and the South East. And many of the us and indeed the audience will recognise you from examinations. And you are now the director of cities. So welcome. Um, I, I just want to start off with a few general questions, if I may. What's the purpose and function of the HBF and how wide is its membership? Yeah. Uh, the, the purpose of the HBF is, is that it's a trade federation. Uh, so we represent the interests of um, house builders operating in England and Wales. Uh, and, and that's mainly private sector house builders, but we also represent a fair number of uh, registered social landlords as well. And our primary role is... is uh, national facing with uh, the national governments of England and Wales, uh, uh, helping those governments to refine and implement their policies, and at a more local level, interfacing with local authorities in doing uh, local plans or combined authorities. And we represent about, uh, we represent house builders are responsible for about 80% of all homes constructed in England and Wales. Uh, and we represent everybody wow. from major house building companies like Barrett, Taylor Wimpey, Persimmon right down to uh, small SMEs and we have about we have about uh, I think we have about 150 SME members uh, uh, wow. now so so yeah it's, it's uh, we represent quite a significant chunk of of new house building in England and Wales. Absolutely absolutely and uh, we have lots of young planners uh, who listen um, to the show so I'm sure they'd be particularly interested in understanding um, what was the appeal of working, as it were, for a trade organisation, the HBF, and what attracted you to um, the, your job in the first place? Yeah, well, I've always been, um, I, I, I'm kind of not a particularly objective planner because I've always been, <laughs> uh, um, I, I've always wanted to fight for, for the interests of housing supply. I, I'm kind of committed in that respect. And, uh, and my, my interest was peaked in the HBF when I was studying planning. Uh, and and I, I interviewed the HBF as part of my researches, and I kind of said, that is the organisation uh, I wanted to work for. And I was very lucky to be employed by them back in 2007, albeit just before the, the big recession hit. But, but yeah, no, I'm absolutely committed to the cause of house building. I kind of believe in owner occupation. Um, I really kind of want people to have adequate housing because uh, um, I want people to really have a modicum of independence, which I think you only get really when you when you're a when you're a homeowner. Uh, I'm a leaseholder myself, so I kind of know all the downsides of, of being a leaseholder. 
ultimately, I'd like to be a freeholder and, uh, you know, I can really see the benefits of that. OK, super. So can you just tell our audience what about what, what identify what the nutrient issue is, which we're about to delve into more detail? So what, what is the, the issue, broadly speaking? And why did uh, EHBF commission the report that was recently published? Yeah, well, we've been we've been dealing with this issue, or particularly I've been dealing with this issue really for the last two years, and it really stems from the Court of European Justice uh, ruling, the, the so-called Dutch nitrogen case, where it kind of concluded that uh, um, specially protected habitats, including special areas of conservation and Ramsar sites in this country, although there is a debate to be had about that, uh, shouldn't be allowed to fall into any uh, worse condition. Uh, and it meant that local authorities can't really allow um, development which might have an adverse effect from proceeding mm. unless they can demonstrate that they will uh, have a, a, a neutral effect or if they will have an adverse effect they have to provide mitigation uh, to ensure that uh, they reach a, a neutral level a, a kind of an issue that Chris Young was referring to with that Rick, Rickman's worst, uh, worst case um, uh, but the problem is uh, as quickly became apparent it's extremely difficult to provide mitigation uh, for many of the homes that are currently stuck. It was easier in the Solent because they were dealing with the issue of nitrogen. That's nitrogen leaching from the land into riverine systems and then downriver into protected habitats. Much harder to deal with the issue of uh, phosphorus. Uh, um, the land take implications of trying to deal with phosphorus is just uh, is is really very very much bigger, uh, uh, and that's one of the problems we've had. So. Um, if you were trying to deal with the issue of nitrogen, which is the issue they're dealing with in, in the Solent, um, you know, something like, um, uh, um, you know, you can, you can mitigate a thousand kilograms of, of nitrogen uh, through a hectare of wetland. Uh, but, uh, but in dealing with the issue of phosphates, which is the issue which primarily affects everywhere else, you know, you'd need something like, um, uh, uh, you know, you'd need to, you need to provide, it can only mitigate about one hectare of wetland can only mitigate about 12 kilograms. And as you know, this issue is spread out around the country. There yeah. are now about 100,000 homes uh, delayed by the issue. And that's why the HBF really had to get involved and, and try and work with government to find a solution. Okay. And so this recent report, uh, we've all noted it was dated in March and it's only just been released. Why is yeah. that? Why yeah. is that? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. I, I was, I kind of, I was, Initially, I was quite hesitant about doing the research at all because I recognised that the advice that Natural England provided to local authorities did tell them that they could use uh, um, their advice is that you use a figure of 2.4 persons uh, per dwelling as a default assumption when you're trying to assess how much uh, uh, um, how much. Uh, nutrient is generated by uh, the housing development. And we knew that was potentially wrong. Uh, it wasn't in line with what the population projections were suggesting for many areas. But I recognise that the Natural England advice uh, did say that you could use bespoke calculations. Uh, but nevertheless, when I'm glad we did go ahead with the research, because when Litchfields looked at it for us, they found out that most, uh, although some local authorities were using their own locally specific data most weren't uh, most and most areas actually show uh, um, that household occupancy rates are well below the 2.4 uh, um, mm -hmm. suggested by natural england um, so i think it was well worth doing the exercise in the end and it was delayed for we did it in march and then we delayed it because we thought that um, we didn't really want it in the public domain when the wyatt versus fairham uh, court of appeal judgment uh, was being um, heard. We thought that uh, um, there are many benefits with Natural England's methodology. We're very pleased they produced one. We might dispute certain elements, but we think on the whole, it kind of serves the industry quite well. What's the big takeaway um, from your report? What, what's the message the HBF is trying to get out there? As a yeah. I, I think the chief message is, is that we were advising local authorities and ideally we'd like Natural England to take, take the, the report on board that 2.4 kind of over, overstates, overestimates the number of people that are living uh, within new homes in these catchment areas. Uh, and that's because, uh, as most planners know, uh, uh, the, you know, the majority of household moves take place uh, uh, within uh, something like one third of household moves take place within 10 miles 
of where they were previously living and something like 50% take place uh, within uh, uh, 20 miles. And therefore, not every new home generates 2.4 new people. Most housing, household formation takes place within the resident population. And the study does look at household formation within the catchment areas, not just the local authorities expected. So the conclusion was that uh, um, Natural England's assumption that 2.4 mm. people will live in each new home grossly overstates the number of people that actually live in the same by, by over double uh, the number. And therefore, the levels of mitigate, mitigation industry is expected to provide is, is very much higher than, than really needs to be the case. What does the HBF consider um, is the appropriate sort of level of response to this issue? Is this something that boroughs and districts can fairly sort out on, by themselves? Or does it have to be addressed at a higher level? Yeah, no, I don't think it can be resolved by local authorities. We started off thinking that it was possible. And when we first started having our discussions with government about this two years ago, you know, in good faith, we, we, we went away to try and find out whether nature-based solutions, which is the government's preferred mm. uh, approach to this, uh, could, be, could be feasible, could be made to work. And we quickly came to the conclusion when we looked at the amount of land that you needed to provide to provide mitigation for dealing with phosphorus, uh, it, it just wasn't possible. I think the government was lulled into a false sense of security with the experience in the Solent when they first started dealing with the issue in 2018. You know, they very they, they relatively quickly within about two years got mitigation schemes up and running, but they were dealing with nitrogen, which requires far less land to mm. mitigate. Um, and, I, and I also think the government thought that the industry would just throw loads of money at the problem, uh, which is what it thinks the industry will always do, uh, because ne commercial necessity will kind of concentrate minds and try and find a solution. But, you know, the industry has tried throwing money at this situation and it just won't work. And that's because landowners and local authorities are very unsure about points around regulation standards and accreditation of nature-based projects. Plus, there's insufficient land supply. Uh, in some places like the Camel Estuary, there isn't sufficient land uh, to provide mitigation within the catchment, which you, you need to do. And we also did an exercise along with South Somerset uh, and Alison Holmes in South Somerset, uh, where you know the amount of mitigation required to unlock the homes delayed there would require something like 5% of the land area of Somerset to be set aside for nature-based projects each year. Uh, so, you know, it just isn't possible. So, so Mary, we've come to the conclusion, uh, and this is what we're saying to government now, is that nature-based solutions is not the solution, uh, not on its own. You know, you, we need to do something at tackling the issue at source. Indeed. Um, so there are other players who need to come to the table and help solve this, uh, of which perhaps Natural England is but one. Uh, are, are these other players, uh, from what you can see, are they actively engaged and focused on solutions? And and really, who are they? Yeah, uh, not really. Names. Uh, I, not really. I think one of the problems we've we've come to realise is that there seems to be a lack of strategic grip or interest in the issue within government and particularly across departments. Uh, indeed, when we wrote to Rebecca Powell, who's the Under Secretary of State for the Environment, about this uh, a year and a half ago, uh, um, you know, her, her response was that it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't her issue, it was a housing issue. Uh, even though nature-based solutions and the role of water companies and Ofwat are clearly uh, part of the issue here in agriculture, you know, it's agriculture and the existing built environment, which are the chief providers, uh, generators of, of nutrient pollution. House building only generates about 4%. Um, so, and and when you look at something like the DEFRA pilot project in the Solent, which they always refer to as an example of what they're doing, it's very difficult to get any information about how that's progressing and and who's responsible for it in its timescale. And when I talk to local authorities who are trying to deal with this, this issue, most of them dealing with phosphates are still many years away from having operational scheme, uh, schemes that could start to unlock development. So, so uh, it, I think we have come to the conclusion, I'm afraid to say, that you know, it's not been taken seriously by, um, by government or by the water industry at the moment. And can we just remind government, uh, uh, and indeed all our, our, our listeners, can we just remind them about the scale of uh, house building, which is currently held back as a result of this issue today? 
Yes. Yeah, it's 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 a hundred thousand homes, and that's based wow. upon statements uh, provided by the local the thirty two local authorities in the areas initially affected, largely down in the south of England, and then forty thousand uh, uh, based upon a survey of our members. Uh, in the areas newly affected from the 16th of March. That's the 42 uh, other local authorities. And and I reckon that that's probably an underestimation because, as said earlier, we only represent we represent 80% of house building. Yeah. There will be other yeah. people, RSLs in particular, who are doing, who are doing more schemes. So it's at least 100,000 homes. So. Wow. So, James, what does the HBF want government to do to unlock this issue? Well, as I said, we, we no longer think that nature-based solutions is the solution. Uh, we think that the uh, it must it must initiate a rapid program of the upgrading of wastewater treatment works to fit them with phosphorus or nitrogen stripping uh, technology uh, to kind of address the problem chiefly at source. We recognise that will cost. It's the view of the HBF uh, uh, that given the profits that, that water companies have been uh, making in recent years, uh, that they should foot the bill. After all, the government felt that it was appropriate for house builders to foot the bill because the profits that we've made on the building safety uh, issue recently. And as they are the chief polluters, and we daily hear about uh, uh, water companies discharging pollution into, into rivers, we, we think they should be uh, responsible and foot the bill. We do know that Rebecca Powell, as I said, the Under Secretary of the State for the Environment, has written to water companies in May, inviting them to uh, investigate the feasibility of ex accelerating that work. Some of that work is scheduled for what's called the Asset Management Plan Period mm. uh, um, 8, which will commence in 2025, and she's asked if they could bring that forward. It is possible though, that the government might adopt something like suitable alternative natural green space and impose a roof tax uh, towards which um, house builders should contribute, although that's not an approach we support, but I suspect that might be a route the government will consider. But it would also require some kind of legislative change, uh, Mary, because at the moment, the way that the Habitats Directive and Regulations is written is that you have to provide mitigation uh, uh, now, not at some future point. And I think the government would have to tackle that as well. Thank you very much, James. Now, I, uh, the comments are coming in thick and fast, which is great to see. Um, I, I'm just going to uh, hand you over to, uh, first of all, Chris, so that Chris can ask his question. And we'll, we'll come back if we get time at the end. Chris, your question. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. I have been looking at the comments, though. And um, uh, I mean, my own view is it's the water companies. I completely agree with you. The uh, Seven Trent, that's my area, £300 million profit last year. They're not investing. And they the Environment Agency allows them permits to actually put certain amounts of polluting material straight into the rivers. I mean, why is that the house building industry's fault? The EA can tighten up those permits to reduce the nutrient levels instantly and the phosphorus levels instantly through their permit system. And as for the investment, you know, let's see the, what's the price of it. Just tell us what the price of it is and then we'll work it out because there is money from landowners. Anyway, that, that's my view. It's completely wrong in a housing crisis to hold it all up when it's the responsibility of the water companies. No question. My question, though, my question, though, is, um, as many, many people know, you commissioned some advice from a gentleman called Charles Banner, uh, who is known to this programme. And what I'm interested to know and what everybody's asking, and they're asking it now, what are you going to do with Charlie's advice um, and his further advice? Because he is directly addressing the legality and the basis of this. Yeah, uh, um, we commissioned two uh, opinions uh, for, for, from Charles, uh, um, an initial one, which we then, uh, it's, it, they're both in the public domain, anybody can use them, uh, uh, which we sent to all and sundry, we circulated to all our members, and I circulated it to local authorities and with government. Uh, um, Charlie can talk more about the detail of that, but, but in essence, what Charlie does is to challenge the lawfulness of Natural England's advice that uh, planning permissions uh, that a court at reserve matters or discharge of condition stages uh, should be subject to appropriate assessment. Uh, that's what Natural England has advised local authorities on page five of its of its advice note of the 16th of March. Uh, and, and Charlie's argument, his contention is that uh, that's a flawed argument, uh, uh, particularly following 
the particular details of the um, of the Canterbury versus Wingfield case and the uh, uh, the, the implications of uh, um, the uh, European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, uh, which has effectively repealed uh, uh, the the habitats regulations. Uh, so about 40 percent of those 100,000 homes are stuck at reserve matters and discharge condition stages, um, even though they have planning permission, you know, in, in outline. So it's a very, very important issue. To a certain extent, we could alleviate the nutrient neutrality problem were government uh, to get behind uh, that opinion. Uh, uh, to date, um, the government has equivocated on that. It's it's kind of not wanted to commit uh, either way. Uh, it's just said to me, uh, we expect developers and local authorities to adhere to the law. Um, we really don't want to have to test that opinion through the courts. Um, and that is why uh, uh, we have uh, been doing some work this week to try and get uh, the government, uh, Michael Gove in particular, the Secretary of State, to try and uh, um, uh, uh, look at that opinion and uh, take a stance on it, uh, um, but uh, uh, and that and that's something that Charlie and I have been working on this week, um, and we'll wait to see where we go with that. We would rather do that uh, um, uh, because you know otherwise it could be a very lengthy period in which that's fought through the courts and there's yeah. counter appeals and 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 such. Um, whether the government would be prepared to do that though, we know that Boris Johnson is very green. You know, he set out his environmentalist credentials. Uh, equally, uh, the government's under pressure now uh, because of the cost of living crisis. Uh, we think there are overriding uh, uh, factors in the public interest uh, for the government to take action on the nutrient neutrality issue to unlock housing. House builders are prepared to do their bit for the environment, biodiversity net gain. We will still be doing nature-based projects to some extent. But, you know, at the moment, we're looking at stalled housing supply not just of 100,000 homes but increasingly num numbers of ho um, numbers of homes because schemes just won't be progressing those areas uh, of well, a, and local a, a plans significant are, volume local plans yeah. are also stuck with this one too yeah absolutely yeah. Um, so the, uh, it's, the, the local plans thing is interesting because uh, um you know, local authorities provide assurances to the planning inspectorate that they're going to introduce these measures and schemes that will address the problem, as in the Norwich uh, um, City uh, uh, joint plan. Uh, but then when you burrow down into the detail, you know, it's still two or three years off before, you know, they've even produced a report. Uh, but I think both sides are kind of anxious to, to not to draw too much attention to it, just so that they can save their plan, that they've spent a lot of money and effort in trying to bring forward. You know, it's an extraordinary situation, the natural England, as this agency of the state, you know, is, is now kind of uh, running, you know, riot over the country, imposing nutrient neutrality and water neutrality and recreational impact zones. You know. Yeah, well, that brings me neatly, actually, to Paul. Paul, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, by all means. And I've got a bit of a run up to the wickets, as I usually have, James, um, which is that Natural England are merely the advisors to governments. They're not the deciders. They can't dictate what local authorities should do. Local authorities can have regards to what they say, um, but fundamentally it's for governments to then issue policy or interim statements or letters like we used to have in the old days um, to say this is how we think we should deal with it until such time as the courts deal with it. So Natural England have Natural England issue standing advice to tell local authorities what they should do. I appreciate you produced the report, but why doesn't a body with, with the eminence of the HBF also produce a similar sort of standing advice as to what we think authorities should do, even if this is what we think you should do in the light of Charlie's opinion? This is not bigging up Charlie Banner because, of course, there are other opinions out there as well. Much yeah, it's, it, it, it's an interesting point, and, and I think it's probably something that um, I'll need to consider, Paul. I, I, I've kind of, I've, it's never occurred to me because I've always assumed that uh, um, Natural England as the government's statutory advisor on the natural environment would just have much greater weight. Uh, and and legally, uh, um, local authorities are, are bound to have regard to what the, that statutory uh, um, body says. So so they're less likely to listen to what, what um, HBF says far more likely to listen to Natural England. And local authorities are very anxious about this. You know, they're very worried about the implications on housing supply in their areas and the loss of affordable housing and planning gain contributions. Yeah. But they're equally, they're very worried about uh, um, acting on Charlie Banner's advice 
uh, because they're fearful of third party um, challenge, uh, you know, an appeal from residence groups or mm. client earth or, or friends of the earth. And and they just can't really afford the, the cost of that. So it, it, it really does require, I think, government to get off the fence. Uh, you know, one of the big characteristics of government, I think, for the last 30 years is its tendency to outsource authority to to statutory bodies and uh, and, and other parties uh, um, so that it uh, it doesn't have to make decisions itself. For which you could say, well, you know, we've elected them to make those difficult decisions. And uh, I think we really, I, I think the issue of, of water neutrality, but also energy supply in this country kind of illustrates the extent of the failure of the regulatory estate to provide basic resources uh, 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 to its citizenry. Uh, and I think it needs to take it needs to take a much more directive uh, role now in these things and, and kind of, you know, it, it's responsible. It is government that is responsible mm. for this issue. It's not natural England. Uh, it, it is government. Thank you very don't, much. Don't necessarily James. Under, sorry. So I was going to say, don't necessarily underestimate the willingness of some authorities to make the right decision, even if they think that natural England have, have made the wrong decision. But thank you, James. I'm sorry, Mary. Yeah, and, no, and a no, couple no. have. You know, we've seen that in County Durham and, and Winchester, and, uh, and yeah. we're hoping we might see a few more. Thank, thank you, you very James. much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Charlie, you were going to take some thank a you, question from um, the audience. Uh, actually, yes. So let's 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 assume that all the reserve matters and discharge conditions homes do get unlocked. Um, that's that's forty percent. We've still got the remaining sixty percent. The need of strategic solution. Um, how about this for an idea? Um, I mean, broadly speaking, there's three contributors to the problem. Um, there's, there's new developments which do con contribute to it. Um, there's um, poor infrastructure by uh, water treatment company, water undertakers, often in breach of their statutory duties. And there's, and there's the farmers who, ironically, are getting paid to take land out of agricultural production. The polluter gets paid, rather the polluter pays. Yeah. always thought that's perverse. And in a food crisis, surely we need all the agricultural land we can get. So how about this way? We, we have a levy, a bit like the cladding levy, and it's split three ways. The developers pay a third, the farmers pay a third, and the undertakers pay a third. Bearing in mind, if the undertakers pull the whole hit, they're just passing on to consumers, and we have a cost of living crisis, and I'm not sure that's politically fe um, feasible at the moment. So you have a third, third, third. And for developers, um, if they contribute towards their third through a Section 106, they are, let's say, the Habitats regs are modified for this purpose, and so they are deemed to have complied with the Habitats regs if they do that. Um, is that workable? Is that is that? I know that was the levy is then used for fast track upgrade, universal upgrade to wastewater treatment works um, across the board, led by government. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that's feasible. I know the Land Promoters and Developers Federation are doing some research to try and assess what the cost might be of upgrading wastewater treatment works. Uh, and I think that would be a, a valuable piece of research and, and, and will probably contribute to that. Uh, it, the, the water companies, of course, have argued that um, this issue hasn't been foreseen, uh, which isn't true, uh, and therefore uh, um, they haven't made provision for it, uh, and therefore they can't uh, undertake these works because otherwise they will have to pass on the costs to um, householders. But in view of the profits they're making and their poor performance, I, I'm not sure that argument will still stand. And your point about agriculture, I think, is a very important one. And I've got a meeting with another meeting with the National Farmers Union tomorrow because they're very worried that that government hasn't undertaken any kind of strategic assessment of the implications of this for land supply, uh, you know, yeah. um, and and food production. Uh, um, but I think a levy split three ways is possibly workable. But as you say, Charlie, it would still require them to deal with that legal point about um, being able to um, provide a levy that will make headroom as a consequence of works which will become effective and operational much further down the line in five or eight years time. You know, that's what we still need. We still need a solution now. We can't wait five or eight years. We, we need someone to, and it surely has got to be government, to actually um, put their hands in their uh, pockets and, and make sure that the uh, sewage treatment works uh, can be actioned now, because that, that surely that's ne got to be part of the solution. Um, the problem is, it's, it's, de it's, a, it's, it's the fact that DEFRA and DLUC are two separate departments, and DEFRA are responsible for water and habs rates, and DLUC are responsible for housing. Well, I'd like to think that our current Secretary of State is the ideal person to um, bring those two sides together uh, in a very practical way, because he's a very pragmatic guy. Um, in, the in the closing uh, moments, may I just quickly ask you Sasha's question? 
Why has the uh, HBF lost uh, uh, the court of public opinion? Why do so few people support new housing in the planning system, do you think, James? Oh, um, well, I, I, I would contest that. I don't think that's the case at all. I think there's a difference between what the commentariat think uh, and the establishment think. And the establishment have always hated new house building. You know, you only need to read... Uh, um, you know the literature of the 1920s and 30s to 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 you know to to understand their discomfort with the rapid rate of house building in this country. Uh, um, you know we were building upwards of 300,000 homes a year in the in the 1930s uh, in the private sector building most of those and and the planning system was partly the response to that. Uh, so so I th- I think they've always hated they've always disliked house building because it it provides for the common man and it doesn't matter whether you're Labour or Conservative. Especially not if you're if you're green or you're Lib Dems, you know the, the people who run those parties, you know, despise house building. But but the people, the ordinary man and woman on the street, you know, very happy with their homes. We have very high satisfaction levels. You know, the latest customer satisfaction survey we had was that you know sort of 91% of people, the respondents to that, and it was a big sample survey. About 100,000 uh, um, surveys would recommend their builder to a friend. And would buy again from that same builder. You know, you know they love homes. I had an electrician come around to my house. This is more anecdotally, you know, and he just moved into a persimmon home. And I, I warily asked him, you know, what do you think about it? He's, he's very happy. You know, gave him three bedrooms for his wife and, and children, uh, you know, a car parking space and a garden. That, that, that's, that's what he wants, you know. But, but you know, the commentary just, just don't like it. You know, they don't get it. So... Just ignore ignore the commentary, but you know. Except the downside is that they they are they do have the they do make policy. You know they have policy making in their hands. Well, James, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand back to Charlie. Charlie, over to you. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you for me too, James. There's, there's so much um, so much to think about here. And you know, if it was an easy easy question, all of this, we wouldn't be talking about it. So um, let's hope that some answers can be can be come up with the so. government. Uh, I know they're working on it. Char- um, Charlie, just to interrupt you, just, sorry, there's so many fantastic comments. There's one from Roland Cooper Maybe. there. Five, 500 hectares of land would be required. So we're going to pass those comments on to you, James, from all the people who've Thank got you. comments and um, making your point for you. 500 hectares of wetland just in a stour catchment. I mean, that's just not feasible, is it? No, it's not. I mean, it's interesting, actually. And I think I don't think we've had so many comments in the chat in any show and that shows yeah, how, on the absolutely. one hand, you might think nutrients is kind of a quite a niche subject, but it just goes to show how far-reaching it is. So, mm. James, thank you. You probably know more about this subject than anybody on the planet. <laughs> so, um, kind of. good on you. Thank you for your work on it. And uh, thank you very much, Lee, for coming on the show. Um, thank, thank you, you very much. for watching. Um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time. Um, take care until then. Have a nice evening. I'm going to go and see thank everybody. Castle. <laughs> thank Bye. you for your theme. Bye. 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 B